I'm Ian Somerville and in this video I'm going to be continuing my discussion of socio-technical systems and I'm going to focus on what's meant by success and failure in a socio-technical system. But first of all, remember <coughs> I talked about there being three important properties in socio-technical systems. The notion of emergence, where behaviour only emerges when we put the system together. The notion of non-determinism, where a system will respond differently at different times to the same input. And the notion of subjective interpretation, where the, be the success or failure of the system depends on the observer, the user or the system stakeholder. If we have a deterministic system, this means that the same sequence of inputs will always result in the same sequence of outputs. Software systems are deterministic entities. If we present a software system with a sequence of inputs, it will always have the same sequence of outputs. Now, of course, the notion of a sequence of inputs is a very complex one because we can have inputs from all sorts of things, not just user inputs. But it is a truism that for sure software systems are deterministic. And it's only when we assemble these into more complex socio-technical systems that we get non-determinism. And non-determinism arises for two reasons, both of them with human, fundamentally human causes. First of all, the operators of a system will behave differently in, at different times, depending on their state of mind, depending on how tired they are, depending on whether or not they're rushing to get home. They will not always respond to an output from the system in the same way. It's also a consequence of system management. Complex systems now have components which are managed by different organisations or different people, and these get updated at different times. And if there's not the appropriate communications or coordination between these, it may be the case that on one occasion, a system will produce a particular input and a different input on another occasion because some underlying component somewhere has been updated. The behavior of a complex system is always going to be subjective. The, the system is designed to support different people doing different jobs. Whether they see a behaviour as a successful behaviour or not depends on what they're trying to do with the system. So we can't get away from this notion of subjectivity. And we can't get away with, with it by appealing to the specification and saying, well, the specification says this uh, and that's what defines the behaviour. How many people ever read a specification? We can't in reality expect them to do so. Complex systems are developed to address what are sometimes called wicked problems. These are problems which cannot be completely specified. They have fuzzy boundaries and edges. Different stakeholders in the system actually see a different problem. They see the problem in different ways. So therefore it's inevitable that they judge whether or not the system is effective depending on their view of the problem. So what comes up initially is that success is a judgment. We can't measure it objectively. And we can only measure success against a deployed system, a system in operation, rather than whatever criteria were put into place when the system was first procured, because the world changes. The notion of how effective a system will be to do a job will change over time as the job changes. Let me give an example here. Say we, say we create a medical information system which has, has two objectives. One is to provide improved quality of care from patients because the clinicians involved have better information about them. The other is to provide better information for hospital managers. These are will allow care costs to be more strictly controlled and so increase the revenue or the profits arising from the operation of the hospital. When we looked at a system like this, we found a fundamental conflict. 
In order to provide the information required for the system managers or for the managers of the hospital, the clinicians had to spend more time inputting information which wasn't directly relevant to the patient's condition. This meant that they had less time to spend on patients. So the quality of care was not improved by the system, but actually deteriorated when the system was introduced. From a clinical perspective, the system was not successful. From a management perspective, it was. They had better information and they could achieve what they wanted to do. Let's now look at failure. Now, in a, in a technical system, uh, a failure is a, a deviation from a specification. And let's assume we can have a, a magical being, an oracle who knows everything about a system and a specification. They can look at a system's behavior and they can say that's a failure because it has deviated from the specification. And this is a picture you might have seen before about there being no small mistakes in civil engineering. Clearly, there's been a bit of a deviation from a specification here. However, socio-technical systems are not quite like that. We observed a, a hospital system which was intended to inform users of the number of available beds in the hospital so that the patient, if a patient was admitted, they knew what beds were available and where these be beds were. Within that system, there was a variable B which kept track of the number of beds. Sometimes B was correct, that is, it reflected the actual number of beds, and sometimes it didn't. When it didn't, is this a failure? Well, the interesting thing about the system was that when we talked to users of the system, none of them felt the system had failed when it reported an incorrect number of beds. In many cases, of course, they didn't know it was reporting an incorrect number of beds because the number of beds available didn't really matter to their job. What their job was to assign one bed to one patient. So at that time, so long as there was a bed available, it didn't matter whether there were 10 or 12 or seven beds available, they only needed one. When it got to the stage of the hospital, hospital being very busy, they knew that it was impossible to make accurate predictions of beds. And I'm not going to why, but there's a whole range of reasons why that's the case. So they didn't expect the system to be accurate and they actually used other techniques to judge whether or not there was a bed available. As well as success being a judgment, so is failure. Specifications are gross oversimplifications of reality. So we can't appeal to a specification to decide whether or not a system has failed. The judgment on whether or not a failure has occurred in a system depends on a range of things. What the observer expects, their knowledge and experience, their role, their context or situation where they're working at that time and their authority within the organisation. It's inevitable that we will get system failures. For technical reasons, I've already discussed this, uh, there will be complex and opaque relationships between components that we won't fully understand and these will sometimes result in undesirable behaviour. But there are socio-technical reasons as well why failures are inevitable. As a system changes over time, what might have been acceptable behaviour at one stage becomes less acceptable at a later stage. Different stakeholders will see exactly the same behaviour and some will consider that to be a success, some will consider it to be a failure. We can't in reality have a complex system without conflict between stakeholders. And because of there's conflict, because there are different objectives, different goals, people trying to do different things, we can't satisfy them all. So therefore, some will see failure while others see successes. Failures are therefore normal in a system. We cannot build failure-free socio-technical systems. Obviously, we want to ensure that the consequences of failure are limited, and that's something I'll come back to in a different video. But the key issue that we have to be aware of is that failure-free operation of a system is impossible and we will always have normal everyday failures. 
by and large these will be small, not important, with unserious consequences. They won't be catastrophic. Failures are not just systems crashing, they're all sorts of things that are less serious than that. And as a consequence, I think it's most helpful to define failure by relating it to the work done by a user. So when a, a, a user or a stakeholder has to carry out some extra work over and above what's normal, this is a system failure. And obviously the seriousness of the failure relates to the amount of extra work that's required. Some people who are very good at things say and have a lot of deep knowledge of the system may be able to correct a failure quickly. For others it will take longer. The seriousness of the failure is different for each of these groups. In summary then, success and failure are not absolute. They're not objective. They depend on the judgment of the observer or the stakeholder in the system. We can't resolve all conflicts in socio-technical systems. So there will always be some failures. Some observers will see failures while others will see successes. Failures are normal and inevitable. And one way to judge the seriousness of a failure is how much work does a user have to do to recover from the failure to get the system back into normal operation. You can download the slides that accompany this video from my SlideShare account.